Welcome to Evil Live, the live media commentary show that answers the question, is there ever a bad werewolf story? Subscribe to the channel because today we are reviewing When Will You Rage? A werewolf anthology from White Wolf Publishing. That's it. Now the reason why I even picked this up to begin with was because I had interviewed Edo Van Belkem on a different podcast and I was impressed with the cut of his jib, we'll say. <laughs> so I ended up reading his uh, first werewolf novel, which was awarded Bram Stoker's uh, fictional award. And um, it was pretty awesome. Like, it was a good novel, a good werewolf story. And then I realized that that was actually inspired by his first short story that he ever wrote, and it was included in this anthology. So I thought, well, I'm already one foot down the rabbit hole. I might as well just jump right in. And boy, did I. And maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> maybe I should have looked before I left because there's a lot of stories and not all of them are good. And more to the point, you kind of have to know about Werewolf the Apocalypse in order, like the game mechanics and, and vernacular to really, truly appreciate some of these, some of them stories. But there are some pretty good ones. So we'll get into it here in a second. Before, uh, those are my initial thoughts. Before I go into my actual review, I want to give you um, a heads up that you can actually become a member of this channel. It now has membership. Now, the membership is a little bit uh, willy-nilly, all right? Basically, it's just two levels. One is that you appreciate the archives of information that I put out here about my past podcasts. And another level is about inspiring me to create and continue creating new content. Either way, it helps out. I appreciate it. Thank you for those members like Chris down below uh, in the YouTube chat. And if you happen to be uh, joining me live and you want to share your thoughts or just anything on any of these conversations, do it in the chat. It's totally fine. And you know, in the comments afterward, if you're not catching a live. But also there's an apparel. I, I went through and I had a lot of different apparel designs from my different podcasts and logos and stuff that I've sort of developed over the years that were just stagnating and sitting there not being used at all and I figure well I might as well just put it up as an option for someone who may be a completionist or just wants to have an original design or or just something to support the channel those links are in the description below so feel free if interested and if you do thank you kindly if not fucking die <laughs> no I'm just kidding um, get eaten by a werewolf though for sure all right, so this entirety of a anthology was edited by Stuart Week, Wick, Wyke? I don't know, doesn't matter. It was published by White Wolf Publishing on May 27th, 1994, and the copies of this book are going for on or around like 40 bucks. Now, the book itself is like 450 pages, but that's 450 pages of really large type. <laughs> so really, it's probably closer to like 300 maybe 305 or something pages. So don't expect a huge volume just based on the page count because the content on each page is um, its pretty big. It kind of reminds me of um, um, Clive Barker's type print in his Aberat kids book series. Eh, young adult, whatever. But first of all, I love the Aberat trilogy. I think it's a brilliant fantasy series by Clive Barker. It was actually optioned by Disney for years, and they were going to make a whole series of movies based on the world and stuff, but they just never ended up getting out of development hell. Um, and that's really the only similarity, <laughs> is the type size. There's no other connections at all. Uh, I happen to be a fan of uh, werewolves because I just grew up loving werewolves. I, I liked vampires, but werewolves, for some reason... I was always an aggressive kid and it just sort of, it connected with me for whatever reason. Other, you know, later in life, I sort of connected in different ways for different reasons. I distinctly remember writing a uh, werewolf short story in fifth grade where we had to like make our own book. So you wrote in the story, you drew the pages, and then you bound them all together with yarn and you made like a little cover out of cardboard or something like that. I made one where a werewolf was stalking a woman and ended up killing and eating her, and my teacher took it to my parents and said, I think your son might have a problem. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, he wasn't not wrong. <laughs> Definitely have problems, plural. Uh, no, I mean, I, I was literally just parroting a 
werewolf series that was on TV at that same time back in my youth. And it was dope. I don't actually remember what it was now. Like my memory doesn't, it's not that sharp. But I remember as a kid watching it going, this is awesome. This is scary. And it was a TV series. So I've got to re- look that up and rewatch it because I remember really, really enjoying it. And it inspired that book, which then got me in trouble for creativity, <laughs> which shock. Maybe it was the murdering of the innocent woman. But I would say, have you ever met a woman? <laughs> no, I'm totally teasing. All right. Um, this has a bunch of different stories, and I'm not going to give you a full synopsis of each of them. I'm actually not going to give you a synopsis of any of them. I'm going to give you like a line, like a reference on whether I like this short story or not, because there are a bunch of them. And that's not really how I do reviews on this channel anyway. If you want like full play-by-play reviews, I got other channels that you can look up and get those there. But here, simplicity is key. Keep it simple, stupid. It's the KISS principle. All right, so the first show, oh, so all of that to say, (laughs) I went off on a tangent. I tend to do this. Um, The novel that's available that's really kind of hard to find, it's out of print, and, you know, it's like 40 some odd bucks for a freaking paperback book, which originally sold for probably around five bucks. You can actually just get a digital version of it, and I have a link to that digital version, which is like two and a half bucks, or maybe it's like three dollars or something like that. But it's a PDF of the actual book for, you know, 35 bucks less, which, yeah, everyone should do that. Yeah, Fifth Grade Adam was pretty awesome, Chris, (laughs) except for the incessant torture by ghosts (laughs) that I I was uh, going through. It was pretty weird. I, I have some, I've had a strange upbringing in life. Uh, Maybe I'll, Maybe I'll tell a story about it someday. Of course, some people watching this will have already heard many of my life stories, so whatever. All right, so the first one's called The Waters of Leth by Bill Bridges. And ostensibly, the whole story is about an amnesia patient coming to terms with the realization that they're actually a werewolf. And I love this concept, right? So this is a great opening short story. So it's basically a guy talking to a doctor. He's like, I don't remember anything about my life. And he's like, I've got all these scratches and wounds. And I remember that, you know, it's set up for the reader as if he survived a werewolf attack. And the doctor is doing his best to sort of break through the, the barrier that his mind has placed to make him, well, that causes the amnesia, whatever it was that caused it. And at the very end of the story, it just fully comes full circle where he's like, Oh, I'm a werewolf. <laughs> oh, shit. I probably shouldn't have told you that stuff. It's pretty interesting take because it it's a sort of bait and switch, you know? He's supposed to be a, a survivor of a werewolf, and then it ends up being that he is, in fact, a werewolf. And Bill Bridges did a pretty good job of hiding it until the end, which I really appreciate. I like surprises. I really like mystery stories where you can figure it out along with the protagonist of the story. But when it comes to something like this, where it's just like a, it's not like a murder mystery or anything. It's just like a straight up good twist of a story. I like having it totally surprising. The second one's called Coyote Full Moon by Sam Chupp. And this is uh, the ostracize of a werewolf and uh, forming of a new tribe. So, and this is one of those where you're, you're presented with this idea that you should know about Werewolf the Apocalypse, the tabletop role-playing game published by White Wolf Publishing. And if you don't know anything about that, the idea of tribes of werewolves makes less sense because we've always seen werewolf films like The Howling, where they live in packs or something like that. But a pack is different than a tribe. It's, it's totally different vernacular, totally different definition. And in Werewolf the Apocalypse, the game, tribes are the style, like basically like the class of your werewolf, whereas the pack is just the people you run with. And so that's, it's, it's a different perception, and if you're going to this without understanding those game mechanics, you're not going to understand some of the lingo, you're not going to understand some of the references, because they talk about different forms that these werewolves shift into. And if you're not aware of what those are, because there's like, a werewolf isn't just a human and then a, the typical werewolf, you know, like American Werewolf in London or something where it's like, or dog soldiers, you know, it's where it's just like a seven, eight foot tall werewolf face, but pretty much human-ish form covered in fur. There's like a, 
a, a mid-stage point between those. Like, there's like two mid-stage points between those where you get from human to a little more bestial to like a really half werewolf, half human, and then you get to werewolf. And then there's like a massive wolf, like a dire wolf, and then there's a traditional wolf form. So there's a whole range. I'm probably, I haven't looked at the game in forever, so I'm not 100% sure on each of the the names of the forms and stuff, but there's a whole bunch of different forms that if you just don't know about them, this is going to be wildly confusing to you. You're like, well, what the hell is Krynos, and why is he changing into Krynos? Like, what is that supposed to mean? And so, whereas Wormwolf, the last novel that I reviewed on this channel, it did a really good job of presenting meaning behind phrases in a non-technical manual way so that you actually felt like you were reading a, an original novel that was just interesting in a world own, unto itself. This very much feels like you're reading a series of short stories based on a game. And, and that can be off-putting for a lot of people. I don't even particularly enjoy most anthologies, if I'm being honest. Uh, I prefer reading novel-sized content. And so it's a little bit tougher for me to get invested in something or a situation or a character it, when I know that it's going to be over in like 10 pages. You know, I'm like, well, why should I even care? I'm just going to finish this stupid story and move on to something else. That's how I see it. All right, so anyway, um, the tribe that you're in, you can actually be kicked out of because they just don't like the, how you act or how, you, how you've behaved or the choices you make or, or, you know, just who you are. And so you can get kicked out and ostracized and you have to found your own tribe or just go it alone in life or, or whatever. And that's actually a death sentence for a lot of werewolves. It's weird because it makes werewolves sound like they're vulnerable and they kind of are in this game, not to humans, though there are humans that can hunt you down and stuff with technology, but you're vulnerable to other werewolves, like bad werewolves. There's like evil werewolves in addition to just mean ones. <laughs> There's also like peace and love and you know, weird ones like that too. Okay, so the next one is A Sheep in Wolves Clothing by Vincent Courtney. And this is uh, the realiza realizing a Nazi was Jewish and was lied to by his father. And this I thought was really, really interesting. So the setup is that um, this is set like right after World War II. So you're still dealing with the fallout of Hitler and his regime and Nazis. Um, this guy, his father was part of the Nazi uh, army and he actually ran a concentration camp. And so he is like 100% in on all Nazi, Nazi propaganda and you're just sort of going that full um, SS werewolf sort of vibe. And it, he's like hunting down this other werewolf who turns out to be his brother, but it's a Jewish werewolf. And the, the Jewish werewolf knows, and the reason why I say Jewish werewolf or Nazi werewolf is because werewolves can't mate with each other. They have to mate with either a human or a wolf to have offspring that then carries that DNA in order to potentially be fully realized into a werewolf. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes it does. It's kind of like a superhero X-Men or something where you just have a chromosome that triggers at puberty and you're like, whoa, I'm a werewolf. Ah! You know, so, so parent werewolves definitely are paying attention to their kids during puberty to see if they actually shift. And if they do, they have to talk to them and explain the whole thing and welcome them into the tribe. But uh, in this particular case, um, the, the Nazi ended up having sex with the Jewish concentration camp member, the female, who got pregnant and had a kid, which is the guy that the werewolf is hunting in this. And he's like confronting him. He's like, look, you're my brother. I know what your father told you. I know the hate you have for who I am and who my people are. And you have to understand my hate for your father, the Nazi who ran the prison camp that allowed him to then capture rape and then murder my mother, your mother, by the way, but everything he told you is a lie. And this is the truth. Just look within yourself and just listen to your own heart and you'll understand it. And it comes to terms where he realizes it. And then the other people in his Nazi werewolf tribe come to try to kill him, realize that he's now on the same side as this other Jewish Nazi because he's also a Jewish Nazi, which or <laughs> a Jewish werewolf. And um, they end up like fighting the bad guys together. It was a really interesting, another interesting twist on the werewolf story set in a time frame that's filled with hate, 
atrocity, just the worst of human expressions, and to twist it around and actually have someone sort of come to terms with the reality of their hate, that it is learned and it's not genuine and it's not valid, that um, I, I like that. It reminded me, when I was a kid, I ran around with a bunch of um, like Aryan Nation type people. I didn't, I had no, my parents never taught me about like racial hatred. And so it was never in my childhood mind at all. I, I didn't, like I grew up playing with, you know, little black kids in the little, um, little ghetto that I grew up in at my early age. And I never really saw other ethnic minorities as good or bad or anything. It was always just the individual, you know, how they treated me is how I reflected it back on them. Um, and so I, I never really like thought, Ooh, I don't like Jews because of what, you know, but the people I ran with did. And so they would always make these little slide comments and stuff, um, derogatory comments about ethnicity and religion and stuff. And so I ended up, um, like actually, cause I, I played harmonica and stuff a little bit, little bit in high school. And so I like came in and with a song called the Jew blues. And I just sort of was riffing on some of the ideas that these Aryan brothers were, you know, burying into my brain that I didn't really realize were horrible. I was just parroting the thoughts that they were sending my way, you know, stuff that they said that I just picked up on. And so my teacher, the amazing woman that she was, I sadly don't remember her name. She um, it was a reading class, and so she decided to completely stop the course that she was teaching, and she got Ellie Weissel's Night, which is a brilliant story about a Holocaust survival uh, survivor, and she had us read that. And it completely changed my perspective on things. I didn't realize that I was being groomed by other, by by this Aryan nation group of friends that I had. I just thought we were just goofing off. I didn't realize what it meant for me to say things that I said or or sing about themes that I was singing about. And that teacher and that book completely opened my eyes to the not just the anti-Semitism that I was expressing as a kid, but the hate that was taught to me that I didn't even consider as hate. Um, and it completely changed everything. And so that's what I loved about this story is it, in a, in a very creative, fictional way, it also forced someone that was taught to hate to realize that you don't, you don't have to hate. You don't have to have something like that define you. It, there's literally no reason for it. And unless there's something they do to you, someone does to you specifically negatively, well, then ignore them. Let them go about their day. Who cares what they, who and what they are or anything? So anyway, that, it, it brought that up in my mind and I had to share it. So the next one's called Transitions, and basically it's there was this corporate takeover by a company called Pentex, which is like the main evil corporation in all these uh, tabletop role-playing games. They discovered and, and they're stopped by an old engineering uh, werewolf. Werewolves are called Garu um, in this series. That's what they call themselves. Um, I don't really remember this one as much. Uh, but because Pentex is always like that bad organization that's ever present trying to destroy the earth and stuff and werewolves are trying to protect it. So that's the sort of, uh, good and bad that's happening. So I don't know that it was by, um, Nigel D. Findlay and it didn't really resonate with me. The next story was Fang of the Wolf by Owl Going Back, which is a kick-ass name, whoever he is or she is a young woman becomes a guardian and a garu. And I like the idea of going from being a child and then running away, then realizing who and what you are, and then deciding to like embrace it and then protect it. And that's sort of what that story was all about. The next one was Hunter's Blues by Scott Sienson. A musician, Garu, leaves everything behind and comes back to get revenge. That doesn't really resonate. Like, I can't remember all the details of that one either. And it must not have been very good or stood out to me at all. A lot of these are just like you could exchange the werewolf for anything else and put it in any setting. It's just sort of a forgetful story. You know, it doesn't really click. Another one's called The Bye Bye Club by Ray Winninger or Winninger. 
kids influenced by back spiral, black spiral dancers. I really liked this one. So this is where there's a bunch. I love stories when it's a kids and they're being influenced and then they realize they're influenced and stuff. But in this particular case, um, the kids were being influenced by um, these what they're called black spiral dancers, which are the evil werewolves. And um, they didn't know it. The kids aren't werewolves. They're just kids. Uh, and in fact, the black spiral dancer werewolves that are influencing them don't ever present themselves as werewolves either. They just present themselves as humans willing to help the kids do whatever nasty deeds the kids want them to do. So, for example, they're like, we're going to go kill this person over here, or if you guys have a name, we could go take care of that instead. And so just on a whim, this new kid says, well, how about the teacher? And they're like, all right. The next day, the teacher's gone, missing, and they have to get a substitute and stuff. And so they're literally setting up people to die without them realizing it, doing the bidding of evil without them realizing it. And I just thought that was a really like vile, twisted way of doing stuff. Kind of dug it. All right, so the next one's called Wolf Trap by Richard Lee Byers. Garou infiltrates a Pentex facility in order to rescue a girl, then becomes hunted. This reminds me of like the X-Men and Wolverine 100%. It's like Wolverine is going in. He has to assault this facility to save another experimented on mutant. And then he has to make it out alive. But then the rest of the X-Men come in and help him, you know, when he realizes that he's going to be overwhelmed. But he, he just he's compelled to do this because that's where he found himself one day. You know, he was in one of these facilities before. It was just a really good story. Again, like I said before, you can transpose this to be a superhero story instead of a werewolf story, and it wouldn't lose anything because it's just sort of generic. But I, I liked it a lot. I like the idea of uh, an older version of something going to protect a younger version of something. You know, just that you know the Mandalorian thing of going to you know protecting Grogu or you know whatever it is. I just I like the idea of protecting kids because kids are awesome, and you need to leave them alone and let them be kids. Okay. So um, the next one's Predator and Prey by David Chart, a wolf being chased, trying to learn a lesson about being a predator. This is interesting-ish, um, where you really need to know the vernacular of this game. You have to know the language used and what the language means, or else this makes no sense at all. But basically, it's just one werewolf talking to a spirit and how he's running away from these bad guys that are trying to kill him. And the spirit's like, you're not prey. You're a werewolf. Act like it. Kill them. Fight them, the people that are hunting you. And he's like, no, but I can. I mean, I know I'm a werewolf, but they're going to kill me. And he's like, it's just, the whole thing is just him talking to a spirit. And then he goes off and he confronts them. And that's, that's it. He realizes that he's a predator. It's really kind of a weird story. And then the next one's Lone Werewolf by Lewis Tilton, a deformed werewolf recovering stolen cubs. This is another one where um, this messed up deformed werewolf. So when werewolves mate together, they produce deformed offspring. And there's actually a name for it that I can't remember right now. But um, this is one of them where no matter what form they take, their hand is always like a claw, <laughs> you know? So even as like a person, they just have like a claw hand of werewolf hand. Um, and so they're like, you know, they stay away from everyone, including other werewolves, because other were werewolves don't like def deformed people. They, they see them as part of the worm, which is just another word for the evil of the world, or this evil force trying to destroy the world. And so uh, it realizes that there's these stolen cubs being taken in order to be experimented on. This is sort of a rubbing theme for a bunch of these stories. And it goes after to help them. And that's kind of it. But it was, I don't know, it was an okay story. It, it just, you, you needed to know the game mechanics in order to really understand it. The next one's called Shards, not Shart, Shards, by Phil Brucato. And this is where a female wolf doesn't connect with her tribe and is broken up with the tribe and then tries to find herself. So she, she doesn't resonate with her tribe at all, and then she ends up going off on her own after a bunch of um, shenanigans ensue. Didn't really stick out in my mind, so it must not have been very, you know, resonant with me. The next one's called A Day Off by Thomas N. Cain, and this is where a man recruited to strike against his corporation by the Garu and then dies uh, and then escapes from the death. Now, I'm trying to remember this note that I wrote in here. A man recruited to strike against his corporation. Oh, I remember. So this guy was, he's just a human. 
and he's working for oh is he a human or is he a werewolf i'm pretty sure he's a human he's working for pentax like a sub corporation of the evil you know bad guys basically uh werewolves approach him and say hey we would like to buy some secrets from you and he's like well i don't think so and they're like look do you like what you do? Do you like the people you work for? Do you know what they do with the technology that you are researching? And he's like, no, I don't like what they're doing, but it's a job and I need a job. And ostensibly, they convince him to be a spy, to give them information so that they can infiltrate this bad guy corporate building and then destroy it. He ends up going with them because he wants to make a mark. He, he feels like, look, I can't do this anymore. They convinced me what I'm doing is wrong. I need to do good. I need to help them. You know, and I can help them along the way because I know this company. And, you know, sort of the security systems and stuff. And so he goes with them. They all get killed off. He barely escapes with his life. And this is all in the period of like a day. So now he has to go back to work the next day and like it ends with this part where he's like do i go back to work i haven't even told my wife where i've been but now i kind of feel alive and i don't really want to go back to what i was doing before it's pretty interesting um especially if you're running like a human campaign and like a human adventure and then you introduce that sort of supernatural element it could be part horror film it could be part adventure thriller i mean there's it, it really like it sort of spurs my storytelling brain into how I could twist it into a really fun story. Okay, what else? Um, Little Flea is next by Scott Urban. And this is where a senator is attacked for... for so basically, um, a senator is uh, going to block a bill that would allow deforestation of uh, a specific forest, the Muir Forests uh, in San Francisco or north of San Francisco in California. And so um, the bad guys want to kill the or drive the senator insane in order to make him not vote for his bill. And he would then lose other uh, backers to the bill, other congressmen and senators, because he's crazy. And so they're like, "Ooh, I don't want to be a part of that. You know, I don't want to be seen as crazy like him. So I'm going to move on. And so the bad guys send a bunch of just what, what are called fomerai, where basically like um, twisted human um, mutants, basically. They're mutated by the evil worm. And they went and grabbed the, the husband, the senator, and his wife. And his son was out for a walk while they're doing this. They all went to the forest, the forest that's going to be deforested, and they're sort of getting to know the area. So the son comes back, sees these creatures attacking his parents, and then um, they, like, the, the creatures leave, and then he goes in there into the, this camper thing. And then werewolves come in looking for the actual bad guys because they're in their territory. Werewolves claim areas. Uh, and so the werewolf is basically like, look, you need to get out of here because I'm going to kill all those creatures. They're like, no, they have my parents. And I don't know if they're dead or not. And I'm going to follow you whether you want me to or not. So you might as well take me with you. And so the werewolf like throws him sack of potatoes over his shoulder, goes after these creatures. They end up getting... Uh, rescuing the father and the mother, killing these creatures. And it's just a really interesting, another really interesting story that's based on the idea of um, environmentalism and protecting the environment, which I'm a fan of. And then also um, a human level story that is influenced by supernatural powers that they did not know existed before. That's the part of this type of storytelling that I really, really love. So that was fun. Um, let's see. A Third World is Next by Graham Watkins. And this is... Did I skip Ada Van Belkins? I did. So Ada Van Belkins' short story was called A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. And this is probably the least favorite story of mine. Because... The, and it's, it pains me to say it. Because it's a truncated portion of what the novel became. And so I know the good version of the story. Now, the good version of the story at the time of writing didn't exist. So he was just writing a short story. And then they liked it. And they said, hey, can you develop this short story into a novel? And that's what he did. And it got awards for it. It was that good. But if you've already read the novel, reading the short story sucks. Because it's just a tiny, 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 tiny little piece of it. And it's wholly unsatisfying to read. 
So I didn't like it. I, I think if you want to read a good werewolf story, go read Wormwolf. Same author, better approach to the same exact story. Okay, that being said. Um, and it was uh, for Old Lang Syne that the kidnapped boy... Oh, no, I am jumping forward. All right, so For Old Lang Syne is the next story by James A. Moore. And that's where a kidnapped boy, werewolf hunter, and three different groups of Garrow try to find him. So these werewolves are stealing this boy because they're convinced that he's going to turn into a werewolf. And then like three other groups are also trying to come in and save him. And it was just really interesting seeing like so many different factions coming together to try to stop this kidnapping. And it's very similar to the next story, which is A Third World by Graham Watkins, which is there are different types of were-creatures so in North America, it's werewolves. In South and Central America, it's like they're called bastet, which is basically were cats, like jaguars and stuff, and panthers. So um, basically, this human woman, I'm sorry, a uh, werewolf woman, went down to South Central, Central or South America, I can't remember which one it was, met up with this um, Latin dude, fell in love, got pregnant, had a wonderful life, father died. And the mother ended up dying um, from mysterious happenstance. I think it was werewolves or something, but it sort of faded out of my mind at this point. Anyway, it turns out that the husband was actually Bastet. So he was a werecat and she was a werewolf. And so their kid was then taken back to the United States, raised by the family, unknowing to him the whole time that he was this sort of bridge or she was this sort of bridge between two cultures. And so she was kidnapped one year at Halloween, most of these stories take place at Halloween, actually. She was kidnapped at Halloween, and um, this werewolf group is trying to protect her from Black Spiral Dancers that are trying to kill her. The Bastet group is coming in to try to save her, and the werewolf group has to face off against the Bastet group, and they have to have this sort of um, coming to Jesus moment, I guess, where they have to just find some reason, like, look, this child is a bridge between our cultures. We have to we want to share our culture with this child so that they realize when they start manifesting their change that it's normal and it's healthy and it's not something wrong with them but we know that the mother was a werewolf so you take the girl first and then she'll come back to us and she's like i just want to go back to my life what is all this shit i don't know anything that's going on this is insane and they're like you can't go back to your life now because those Evil werewolves are going to keep coming back for you if they know that you're home. So you have to have the protection of your tribe. And so you, you spend time here and then you come down south and you spend time with us and you'll know exactly who you are. And I thought it was a great way of presenting this idea of a multicultural family who, ha like the daughter has no idea about any of it. And now she's suddenly thrown into this whole world that she knows nothing about but is forced to reconcile with. It's kind of fun. All right, so the next one is uh, Useless Death by Don Bassingthwaite. Agero, readying for an honor fight, visits his dead friend in the penumbra. So the in the werewolf world, you have the umbra, which is like the spirit world, basically. And there's different versions of that, like the penumbra is closer to reality and earth than the other ones and stuff. But it's all basically in the umbra, the, the spirit realm. And then there's the human realm and stuff. So this guy, and it's not revealed till later in the story, he actually kills his friend because he's gay and, and he's a werewolf and he's gay and he's afraid that his friend, who's also a werewolf, is going, who's not gay and he was attracted to him, is going to tell other people. Werewolves apparently don't like, or he's afraid that the other werewolves wouldn't like him because he's gay. This was written, again, we have to remember the era that this was written in, 1994. There were no... Gay men and women were still ostracized and beaten and murdered in some cases, as recent as 1994. And so we have to sort of divorce our minds from the way we perceive the culture of homosexuality now versus how it was back in the 90s when this was written. And it is very different, very different. So he was terrified that he was going to be murdered and killed by his own tribe mates simply because he liked men. And that was it. Um, and so he ended up killing, sadly, his own friend because he didn't want him to tell anyone else. And then he has to deal with this honor killing uh, or this uh, challenge of an honor fight. 
And he, the whole story is about his friend coming to terms with how he died, the spirit version of his friend in the spirit world, when he visits him, and him coming to terms with the truth of who and what he is and not being afraid of it. And it's, it's all, I think, um, a metaphor for, for gay men and women coming out of the closet. I, like, that's what this story kind of reminded me of, just admitting who you are and owning it and not being afraid of how others are going to react to you and just be content and happy within yourself. And I think that's a beautiful message. In the time that this was written, it could still be dangerous. And so regionally, we'll say that's a good message. In some cultures, you still need to hide if you're a homosexual or a queer because you can be fucking murdered for it. It's insane. It's ridiculous, but it's true. I mean, not 10 years ago, ISIS, was ISIS 10 years ago? Maybe six years ago? ISIS was throwing homosexuals off of fucking buildings. So there are a lot of cultures out there who still do not understand that simply you preferring one type of person over another literally means nothing. They think it is like life and death and it's fucking dumb, but that's why I like the story is because it reminded me of a metaphor for that. And in a modern sort of Western culture where we don't give a fuck anymore, like do whatever the fuck you want, just don't hurt people and make sure that it's consenting adults, you know, that's a welcomed message. All right. So, uh, the next one is Callie's story by Alara Rogers. This is the second, the penultimate story. The second to last, a baby taken by a Gera who is revealed to be a black spiral dancer is saved when um, she's abducted. This is a great story because this is another one of those twists where black spiral dancers are like hunt down this girl and they say, and there like there's this huge fear amongst the werewolves that you would be like seduced by the darkness and become a black spiral dancer. And so this young werewolf is like a worried because she's being hunted by these. And it turns out that her mom was a black spiral dancer and her aunt and her mom was killed. Her aunt wanted a connection with her sister, but she was murdered, found out about a daughter. And so she's going to save her daughter. And so it's this interesting approach of the evil werewolves are trying to find their family and bring their family back. And the good werewolves are trying to save this girl from her fate if the bad guys get her. And then uh, she ends up like teaming up with her young friends who are also werewolves, her pack. And they go off to try to find her aunt to kill her because she doesn't want to be evil. And she knows if her aunt's around, she's going to keep coming back trying to find her. And they all get murdered by the Black Spiral Dancers because they're fucking kids. And she's then abducted. And this, there's this really weird moment, too, because the character is a hermaphrodite because she is that result of two werewolves. And so she's sort of deformed in that way. Um, and the aunt is, like, sexually attracted to her. And she's, like, groping her genitalia, asking her if this works and how she wants to use it. And the girl slash boy is just like, fuck you, no! This, I'm not okay with this. You're going to have to kill me. I don't want to deal with this. But she's ultimately saved by the good guys and the good guy or the good werewolves. And they end up blowing up the, the hive of the evil uh, werewolves. This was a wonderful story also about what, again, it could be a metaphor for someone who is uh, trans. It's in, you wouldn't think it in our culture, but it's incredibly rare that someone is trans, but it is something that has existed for all of human existence. And the reason is, is that everyone is by default female. It takes an extra chromosome to be a man. And so some men, and it's usually men that deal with trans uh, identity issues, though women do as well, but it, prevalence is more on men. And I, this is just me guessing. I think it's because they have an extra chromosome and they don't feel like they should. And it's just sort of an identity issue with this internalized um, feeling of, of what they connect with and what they don't. However you want to perceive it, it's fine by me. I don't care. However you want to be identified, I don't care. doesn't matter to me. So it's not like I'm trying to make a judgment here or anything. But I think it's an interesting story that could, I think it could help 
trans people come to terms with who and what they are through the lens of this Callie character who as a young girl started out as a young girl and then when it realized she had both parts she transitioned to identifying as a man and lived her whole life as a man and then when her aunt came her aunt was calling her the girl and she was like but I'm not a girl like I don't understand who you think I am I'm not who you think I am and that's when she started like groping her parts and stuff and getting real creepy and fucking weird but I don't know like there's a lot that goes like I can't identify with it and so I, I don't, arguably, I shouldn't even be speaking about it if I don't really identify with it. But I am 100% behind the idea of someone coming to terms with who they are and accepting it and for the greater public at large to not give a fuck. And so if someone can find some sort of comfort in another's story of coming to terms with who and what they are, all the better. And I feel like this story might be able to do that for some people. So, anyway, uh, I thought it was a pretty good one. Uh, Trickster Moon by J.S. Banks is the last story, and it's the playwright Garu who is tempted by the worm. I, I read this this early this afternoon, and I don't remember anything about it. That's how boring it was for me. Like, I was struggling. Basically, he was writing the three-act structure of a play all the while. He was like... <sighs> I can't remember. I, like right now, it's like blanking me and I just read it. So shit story. And then the very last section of this novel was a lexicon, where it's just basically explaining the vernacular of the werewolf world, um, which was definitely necessary. And they probably should have put that at the front of the novel so that you start there because I didn't even know it was there. I'm just reading a PDF. Um, and it would have been nice if it started there. So yeah, again, the reason why I did this is um, uh, I read this based on Wormwolf, the last review, and so I wanted to hear more stories and see the original short story that Wormwolf was derived from. And this all anthology completely takes place in San Francisco during Halloween of 1994. It references the Northridge earthquakes that made up an unnamed human with a left red eye, as mentioned in the story of Wolf Trap. Uh, a recurring theme with the San Francisco with anthologies is referencing each other's stories and main characters. Because with all of White Wolf's tabletop role-playing games, which I thought was kind of interesting, and I didn't know it until my a few reviews ago, was that they all have like an overarching meta plot over time. And it starts in one place and it ends with each revised edition and it progresses the plot forward with every edition. So every edition isn't necessarily a big game mechanic update. It's like an era update, like a timeline update of the meta story that's happening. I thought it was kind of interesting. I think it would be really hard to play through, but I thought it was a kind of interesting approach to versions of role-playing games. And you kind of see that with this. You know, this sets you up in one little spot but then it sort of progresses forward and is then carried on with other stories and novels and stuff, which are spin off from either short stories here or other aspects of the meta plot that they wanted to explore. So I won't be reading any more of these books or novels or anything. I don't particularly find most of it interesting. I just really liked the Wormwolf one, and so I wanted to explore more of it. Thought I'd share my thoughts with all of you. All right, so that being said, I gave it three out of five evil eyes. There are some good stories here but they're few and far between and you have to understand the game vernacular to understand what they're fucking talking about, which is a negative. So you should not have to understand that in order to read a good story. So I dropped it a few evil eyes for that. In either case, thanks for tuning in and uh, sharing your thoughts here. Actually, let me go through some of these thoughts really quick. If a werewolf procreates with a wolf, is the child different than if the werewolf procreates with a human? I don't, yeah, I never, I never thought I'd say that. I don't think so. It's not presented that way. Um, the reality is, is a human can turn into a wolf. So why wouldn't a wolf be able to turn into a human if that's the offspring? Um, and there's some of these stories where these people prefer to be in wolf form or they find themselves in wolf form longer and for longer periods because they just connect and, and, and identify as that more than a human form. So it is this sort of full-fledged sense of identity that is inspired by the tribe that you were born into, by the parent that brought you in, but also just your own experience and your own, and they call it 
Ah, oh, shit. I can't remember what they call it. Basically, you're born in a certain phase of the moon, and that influences your personality al- along with your tribe. So it's basically like your class and race for other role-playing games. Um, and uh, it, I don't know. I find, I find it an interesting dynamic. It's a little bit clunky to deal with as far as game mechanics go um, because it's almost like rolling in alignment with your ethnicity and your class. I don't know. It's It's a little strange. I do remember having a lot of fun playing the game, though. So to answer your question, you can still turn into a human. It doesn't matter. Because you're a werewolf. You're not a human or a wolf. You're a werewolf. You're Garu. Um, it's cool that werewolves in North America and other were creatures from different parts of the world specif- specific to the region. Yeah, and I think it is primarily... I, I don't know that they have them... I haven't read a bunch of the game material, so I would... I know that, like, um, for example, the werewolf or the vampire ones, there are different versions in different continents that are hyper-specific to those continents. So I would imagine it would be the same thing with werewolves, but I don't really know because I just haven't really done a deep dive into it. And quite, I, I'll probably run a one-shot with werewolf, but that'll probably be it. You know, I, I don't imagine I going back into this and you know, getting swept up into it or anything. Um, Good fantasy, like good sci-fi, is a great medium for tackling difficult topics. Yeah, that's what I love about sci-fi. I remember um, early on, I've always taught my kids to accept people for who they are and how they treat others. Not because I'm like a good Christian man and I want Jesus to love me. No, just because I don't want my kids to be dicks. I want them to be good people. You don't need religion to be a moral human being. And so I teach my kids not to be bigoted, not to be sexist or racist, just to accept people on their own terms of who they are and how they are treated by them. And there was one time that one of my kids came home and they made some sort of derogatory comment about um, a gay kid. And I immediately like stopped and I like sat them down and I like looked at them like, I did not raise you to be a bigot. You don't hate people because of who they are or, you know, their, where they were born or how they identify sexually or, or gender, you, you hate them because they're dicks. <laughs> and then it's okay. Then hate anyone you want. If someone treats you like shit, hate them. It's okay. But don't do it just because they're one thing or another. That's ridiculous, you know? Have a reason behind it. All right. So that is it for this. I hope you guys had a, um, I don't know, interesting ride with this review uh if you like werewolf stories maybe get it and read it if you're not interested in werewolf stories don't at all just avoid it wholeheartedly if you want a good werewolf story read wormwolf by ado van belkham uh that is it thank you all for tuning in as always like it or not evil spelled backwards is live so get out there and be evil (laughs) 